Nice. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining our session this evening. The Real About Real Estate, the Home Ownership Process. My name is Brother Gibson, and I'll be moderating for this evening. And I just want to thank everyone for tuning in this evening. We're going to have a fun session this evening. It's going to be a very informative session. So if you have, if you don't have pen and paper, I suggest that you get pen and paper um, or some device that you can use for uh, taking notes so you can get down as much information as you possibly can. So this evening we have um, a few uh, people that are gonna be on with us. So I, I'm gonna go ahead and begin by introducing um, our first person. She's a realtor here in Baton Rouge, uh, a native of Baton Rouge. She holds a BA in business as well as an MBA. She's a second generation real estate investor with over 16 years of being a licensed realtor in the state of Louisiana. She's married to her high school sweetheart. They've been together for 24 years and married for 19. They have two beautiful kids together, a junior at Louisiana State and a junior at Central High. She and her husband have been investing in real estate for well over 10 years. Working with investors is her niche. Uh, she provides herself, she prides herself on representing homeowners and future homeowners. She is committed to listening to her clients, understanding their needs, then utilizing her keen sense of negotiating skills to ensure a successful transaction. Within the last three years of retiring from a previous occupation, she has remained in the top 1% of her field and has become an esteemed realtor highly regarded by her clients and professionals in the industry. She's opened the doors to her boutique real estate firm, Marshall Realty and Investment Group in October of 2018. She has a reputation for loyalty, communication skills, and is revered as one of the most trusted realtors in the greater Baton Rouge and surrounding parishes. You can always count on her to readily answer all of your questions. She empowers her clients to become more knowledgeable and educated throughout the real estate process. She showcases her homes on multiple websites and utilizes a team of professional service providers to assist her clients buying and selling needs, such as stagers, painters, designers, handymen, and inspectors. She is very communicative throughout and detailed oriented, and she'll be alongside you every step of the way. So I want to introduce Ms. Lisa Marshall. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me this evening. Amen. Good to see you, Sister Marshall. Thank you. Same here. All right. Next person we have up is Mr. Whit Green. Mr. Whit Green is actually a home inspector. Uh, he's a home inspector, realtor, and former home improvement contractor. And he has a list of qualifications that uh, let you know that he knows what he's doing in this business. Uh, he's a certified professional inspector, certified residential inspector, certified indoor air quality inspector conducting mold testing, state licensed wood destroying inspect and insect inspector, member of the certified commercial property inspector association, and an FAA licensed drone pilot. Hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> Oof and hard to reach inspections. Uh, we'll have to talk about that one. Yeah. Uh, again, that's uh, Mr. Whit Green. Thank you for joining us today, Whit. Thank y'all very much for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, next person we have is we have Sister Latoya Harrison. Sister Latoya is a wife and mother of four beautiful children and has been in the mortgage industry for over 17 years a licensed mortgage loan officer for 13 and a half years. She's licensed in Louisiana, Texas, Mississippi. She's known as the home loan scientist. I don't want to talk about where you got that one from. <laughs> I believe everyone needs to have their name on title deed of a home and that this is one of the key pieces to building wealth. We make smart buyers. I've helped hundreds of fi families finance their purchases and refinances, and I'm always happy to help the next one. The 
Harrison team does home loans with a smile, and she is always smiling. If you, if you see, always. Her. always. <laughs> okay, and finally, I guess I'll uh, do this. I, I'm actually moderating, but I was supposed to be a part of the panel. But uh, I am the broker owner of Worldwide Properties Real Estate Services, located here in Baton Rouge. I'm a husband of almost 19 years. So we have 16. We have two 16-year-old twins, a boy and a girl. My journey in real estate started a few years before I actually decided to pursue becoming licensed to sell real estate. When I decided to purchase investment property and didn't feel like I got the best deal that we could get, which I learned uh, after I actually became a licensed realtor. It was at that time that we decided to get licensed and learn as much as possible about real estate so we would better be able to assist others with their real estate dreams. In the 16 years since I became licensed, I've been able to assist countless others with navigating not only the home buying process, but leasing of commercial properties, investors, um, an investor as well, uh, and with uh, uh, helping investors with purchasing investment properties also. And my motto is spreading the good news about property ownership worldwide. So again, I want to thank all of our panelists for being here today. And we're going to go ahead and jump right into uh, these questions. And if there's anyone uh, that's watching that uh, wants to uh, submit any questions, feel free to submit those questions and we'll try our best to get to those questions. So our first question is, and um, we'll kind of open this up. Uh, Ms. Latoya can answer, anyone in, uh, on the panel can answer. Home ownership versus renting. Which one do you think is actually better? <laughs> okay, I'll jump in on that one. Go See, with it. Um, home ownership versus renting. Of course, the general answer of, is going to be owning a home, right? They call it the American dream. Renting is not the American dream. I tell people there's three smart reasons why owning a home is better than renting. Number one, is the opportunity you get to build equity. Mm -hmm. Number two is the tax breaks that you get for being a homeowner. And number three, just a larger return on your investment. You know, I tell people if you take the thousand dollars you're paying in rent, ride down the interstate, wind the window down, throw it out, you'll never see it again. <laughs> that's a negative return on your investment. Whereas if you own your property, you do get to see a return on that investment. Exactly. Yeah. So in other words, uh, they're basically renters are helping to build someone else as well. Someone else is getting a return on that investment. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So let's say someone decides that they're ready to purchase a home. Uh, what are the first steps that that person should take? Uh, let's let's ask uh, Sister Lisa to answer that question for us. Um, for me, and everyone is different, but for me, the first thing would be to make sure that you're speaking with someone that's knowledgeable. Um, the first point of contact could be a loan officer, or it could be a like a licensed loan officer, or it could be a licensed realtor. Um, a lot of people like to take to Google or their friends. Um, we all know that everything is Googleable, but you can't re rely on Google all the time. Mm -hmm. um, it's very imperative that you speak with someone that is knowledgeable about the entire process so that it doesn't feel that it's a nightmare or it's scary or it's going to take five months to get a house. Um, if you have the right team, then it's very easy. Okay. Uh, what about you, um, Ms. Latoya? What do you have to say about that? I 100% agree with Lisa, and I love how she she stated a licensed realtor, a licensed loan officer. You know, God bless our family and our friends. You know, sometimes we take to them too, Lisa. And uh, I say, you know, I bought a house 50 years ago, and uh, you know, all I had to do was go shake somebody's hand. I can't believe you have to turn yeah. in. And stay yeah. Yes, so it's definitely stay current, stay up with the times. Guidelines change on a daily basis, sometimes monthly, weekly, daily. So make sure you speak with someone that's actively doing the business. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Whit, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I just want to state that I've you know been through that process many times, and 
you can't stress how much you have to listen to somebody like Latalia when it comes to your financing. You have to get everything right. And once you do, if you listen to her and you listen to what Lisa has to tell you, you'll get in a house. And there's nothing better for your personal finances long term than buying a house. Yeah. So listen to them. Exactly. OK, good. Good job. Good answers. OK, so once someone is ready to actually start the home buying process, uh, would you recommend that they contact a bank or a mortgage company or uh, who, how should they get their finance and going or find out what's going on with them to see if they qualify? You know, that's um, actually a very, I'm sorry, I jumped in. I assumed you were talking to me. Yes. Uh, excuse me. But um, that's a very, very, very good question. And I do hear that a lot. Hey, what's the benefit of talking to a mortgage company versus my bank? Well, I literally just met with a client today who had uh, met with a banker, someone at his local bank, and he just did not like what he was hearing, the terms, the money required to put down, the time frame, you know, and he just thought that he would get a better option because it was his bank. So in layman's terms, I'll say this. If you go to Walgreens, they have a pharmacy, and then they have stuff in Walgreens, right? But they're not necessarily advertising the stuff. They want you to go to their pharmacy. Whereas if I go to Walmart, Walmart has all the stuff, but they also happen to have a pharmacy. But they're not necessarily advertising that pharmacy. They want you to get your stuff. Well, with the bank, they want you to deposit your money. They're depository banks and they want you to make deposits. And oh, yeah, we happen to have a little mortgage section back there. That's not their focus. So it's going to be their way of the highway. Whereas you come to someone like us, we're a direct seller servicer to Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Ginnie Mae. So we literally have all of these different customizable options. Whereas if you were good to go to a bank, you're kind of limited. So short answer is more options dealing with the direct mortgage company. Exactly. Uh, Ms. Lisa, you have something you want to add to that? I don't know how I can follow behind that. I'm making an analogy. I'm still in that, Latoya. Um, but uh, I'll say that I, what I tell my clients is the same thing. Um, of course, I always leave the option up to them. But I do tell them your big box banks or your local credit unions, they may not offer all of the programs that Latoya may can offer at her company. They, She can go from, like, she's the science of the numbers. So the people at the bank, they want your deposits, but they're not specialists in the loan program to break it down to you like Latoya can. Mm -hmm. and I know that for a fact. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to our, our next uh, question. Um, once someone decides to begin this process, uh, are they locked into necessarily if they have one person to pull their credit, can it, if they go to someone else, looking for different terms, does it, how does it affect their credit? Uh, you know, I'm looking at you again, Latoya. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So technically when someone initially gets their credit pulled for a mortgage application, they actually have about 13 to 14 days, a 13 to 14 day window to do their due diligence of shopping without it actually affecting their points. So in other words, you go to one mortgage company, you try another one in two days, you try another one in another day, we should all get the same credit score. So I hope that answers the question. That was perfect answer to that question. Okay. Absolutely. So what's considered, um, what type of qualifications would uh, someone like yourself uh, be looking for for someone to come in um, that's looking for financing? Oh, I drew something up for you guys because I didn't get permission to share my screen. So I want to show you something that I drew. You ready? Okay, guys. This is the qualifying cross. If anyone has the ability to screenshot, go ahead and steal it. Just give me some credit, okay? Um, and not credit like this. Okay. But anyways, I wanted you to see my qualifying cross. So whenever you start the process of purchasing a home, these are the big macros of a loan. OK, so you want to know what is my income? 
Okay. Do I have any assets? Do I have any savings? Do I have any property to sell? Do I have a car I can sell? Do you have any liquidable assets? Okay. Credit. Who do I pay out monthly and what is my score? Okay. And that who do I pay out monthly is actually what your debt tells us. And here's a cool thing. What we look at for affordability is these two things right here. My debts up against my income will literally tell the lender my affordability. So if you're gathering documentation, if you think about it, if I ask for pay stubs, if I ask for bank statements, if I pull your credit, that's all speaking to this cross, you see? So you gotta go to the cross if you wanna get a home loan. You see what I did there? You see what I did there? I see that, that was, that was nice. <laughs> yeah. That was nice. So, so that's basically that's referring to the debt to income ratio. Mm -hmm. debt so, to ratio. what percentage wise, what would you say uh, is is a percentage that they probably need to stay within uh, for the debt to income ratio for uh, to them to be eligible candidates for finance? Sure. So, the general safe zone is forty five percent or below, and when I say forty five percent, okay. I'm talking about, just like when I'm looking at this cross, if I take my car loan, my uh, credit card, my minimal payments that I'm paying out, so I'm not talking about your water bill or you know the utility bill or anything like that, but literally, who am I paying out monthly? And then I'll even add in my potential house note that I think I can handle. Right. So if I say I want my note no more than a thousand dollars and I have maybe a car note or something like that, all I'm doing is dividing those numbers by my gross before tax deductions or anything income. It's going to spit me out a percentage and tell me how much house I can or how much my debt to income ratio is. So have an idea. That's a great thing to do when you want to start buying a house. I tell people already establish for yourself a monthly budget. So say to yourself, OK, I think I can handle a thousand dollars. OK, well, think about that thousand dollars plus that car note, plus that little loan you got here and there monthly. What are you paying? And we divide that by that income to get the debt to income ratio percentage. Good information. So, uh, Ms. Lisa, for as far as uh, once that client, let's say they do get pre-qualified um, and they're approved for, I don't know, let's say $200,000. So they get their pre-approval letter from Ms. Latoya saying they can go up to $200,000. How do you handle those clients if they say, let's say, for example, well, this is what I can afford, but this is what I was approved for. Um, how do you handle those type of clients and those type of situations? So that question um, for me is always asking our initial consultation. And I always advise my clients, we never want to be house poor. Um, and what that means is you don't, if you feel that if Latoya says that you're approved for 200,000 and your payment is going to be 1300, but you're only comfortable with paying 800, then you need to have a conversation with Latoya and say, Hey, I don't want to pay over 800 or 850. When I start looking with Lisa, what is the top, what is the, the, the amount that I can look up to, to make sure that I don't exceed my budget of the 800 or 850, whatever that golden number is. Um, of course you may, uh, once you start looking, those numbers may change. You may feel that, okay, I'm not finding what I need in this price point. So I may have a little wiggle room, but initially I am going to ask that question because again, you know, you get enticed when you go out and you see the glamorous $200,000 homes and you don't want to feel that pressure <laughs> purchase a two hundred thousand dollar home and then paying twelve or thirteen hundred dollars a month when you're totally comfortable at eight hundred because you still want to take your kids to Chuck E. Cheese or McDonald's or you still want to go to the beach whenever we may be able to go back to the beach. Um so you still want to be comfortable while living in your home and not going paycheck to paycheck. Yeah that's that's actually um that's exactly the same thing I do and usually tell my clients as well. Um, you, you never want to get yourself in over your head, um, even though it, it and it's, it's difficult because people will sometimes pressure you also to try to go out and look at those homes, even though they've told you that 
you know, what they can comfortably afford. So sometimes you're in a, a situation to where um, you're kind of fighting against what they've told you as opposed to what they want to go out and do. You know, so that was a uh, uh, that's a really good, uh, really good response there. So can I, uh, can I interject something with that same thought? Yes. And Lisa, that is that says so much about the way you do your business, because you have that conversation before right. even working. And I tell you, I've learned to add one more question in there. You know, I always ask, what is your comfort level? Mm -hmm. I always say that. But I ask one more number. I always ask what's your walk away or your ceiling. So everyone, when they want to invest in anything, they have to set their margins. You have to set a floor and you've got to set a ceiling because the ceiling most times is a number that's looming out there that makes them nervous. Maybe they don't want to face it. Maybe they know it's realistic, but it's good in the consultation phase before you're looking to really consider what that could be. You know, if you fell in love with the home, and you had to pay one dollar over this number right here what would make you walk away yeah. you have to know that and that way you can set your own boundaries and enjoy your process of shopping <laughs> i think that's important that's it's, that's a good point also uh because i think it's important because a lot of times um and, and i'm sure sister lisa has probably had this also you'll get clients that are just ready to go and look at properties and they haven't even gone through the process of actually getting qualified for anything. No. So they've gone online, they've done searches, they've seen these $200,000, $300,000 homes, and they want to go take a look at them. And then they call you as a realtor and say, hey, look, I want to go take a look at this property. And my first question or one of the first questions always is, well, have you been pre-qualified? Have you been pre-approved? Yeah. And if the answer to that is no, then I suggest to them to go through that process first. So they know what they can comfortably afford and that way we're not necessarily spinning our wheels going out looking at properties that they may not even be qualified to purchase exactly exactly because most of the time i feel when they are online and they are shopping before they contact a professional that they are being um they're looking at zillow our favorite zillow.com <laughs> And Zillow is telling them that they can purchase a three hundred thousand dollar home for seven hundred dollars, um, but it's not telling them that you have to pay taxes and insurance. And if the property is in a flood zone, you may have to pay flood insurance. So, you know, we have to bring them back in and say, "Hey, let's start all over. Let's go back to that initial consultation that we need to have before you head over to Zillow, and then we can get you going." Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The the. Some of the online sites are, are good for some things, but boy, they, 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 they bring some other issues in other areas as yeah. well. So. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's move on, because um, I know Mr. Witt is anxious for us to get to him also, and I, I definitely we definitely need his expertise in this conversation too. So, um, so uh, our next uh, question is gonna be, if you can, give us the differences between an FHA and a conventional loan. Ms. Latoy. Mm, yeah. So um, FHA is a government insured loan and conventional loans are government regulated. So they're not insured or backed by the government, but they are regulated. That's one thing. Um, your FHA loan, being that they are government insured, you do get a lot more leniencies with those regarding your qualifying costs. Sometimes they can be a little more lenient. For example, uh, we talked up earlier about what's a good debt to income ratio. And I said, well, the safe zone is 45. But truth be told, I've seen FHA, I've closed them up to 56 or 57 percent in a DTI. Right. You'd never see that in a conventional loan. Uh, your FHA loan is super ideal for your first time home buyer simply because they just have such a smaller down payment requirement. Uh, starting at 3.5%. Whereas with conventional, sometimes you'll start anywhere from 3 to 5%. So uh, you'll just see a lot more leniencies there. FHA is pretty based on their interest rates. Um, whereas conventional sometimes can penalize you or not based on your credit. You know, um, PMI, 
is different with conventional based on your credit, whereas, is, is, whereas it is the same for FHA. So you'll have somebody with an 800 credit score and someone with a 580 credit score. They all get the same PMI with FHA, whereas that would be super different with a conventional option. Um, let's, uh, let's, let's kind of let's kind of give them an idea of what PMI is. Yep. So PMI is private mortgage insurance. And anytime you're borrowing more than 80% of the sales price of a home. So say, for instance, you have a home that's $100,000 and you want to borrow $97,000. Well, that's 97%. So you're considered super risky. So you're going to be required to insure the rest of that mortgage balance, right? With PMI. And you'll see on a conventional option, as you continue to approach that safe 80% mark that your PMI actually can go away. Whereas on a government loan, you will not see that. You'll kind of keep it throughout the entire life of the loan. So private mortgage insurance is required when you're borrowing over a certain amount of the sales price or loan value of a home. Okay, thank you for that answer. Uh, we, we could stay on the financing portion of this. God knows how long. Uh, but we, we want to go on and, and progress to, okay, now that we've gotten pre-approved, we're out there looking for a home. Um, we have a realtor, but maybe Ms. Lisa can kind of give us a little bit of detail on, uh, number one, what a realtor's task or responsibility is to uh, their client. Um, I think I cut out just a little bit. The What is the... What is a realtor's task or responsibility um, in helping their client through the process? It can vary for me. For It can vary from different agent to agent. But the, for me, the most important thing is making sure that it's so important to me to make sure that my client is knowledgeable and they understand the process from beginning to end. I never want to meet a client and have them to go through this entire process and all they say is yes ma'am. Um, I want them to understand um, my rights to them and their rights to me and make sure that when we make the agreement for me to be their realtor or charge that um, reaching out to me is always just a phone call away and to make sure that they understand what the, the non-page purchase agreement entails, making, making sure that they understand what their lender is working with Latoya, I'm certain that we, they will understand everything. But just say, for instance, if they decide to branch out and use their own personal bank, well, the finance terminology can become very, very tricky. And I mean, some of them just don't break it down. Um, but, you know, and, and I find that sometimes clients or buyers, they will result to coming to the real thing saying, hey, my loan office is like this, but I have absolutely no clue what they're saying. So that's why in the very beginning, it's all I made the, the, um, I stress that it's important to make sure that you're speaking with someone that's knowledgeable because you should be able to, for instance, Latoya, she can, she can be able to tell if she's talking above someone's head and she needs to break it down. And the same for me, and I'm sure the same with it. Because when you're on a roof, I mean, yeah. you're talking about flashing and and all of the shingles and, and this degree angle, you know, all of that can just go over someone's head. So you have to understand your client to make sure that when you are working with them, it's not just, hey, sign here, sign here, sign here, let's get you to the closing table. You want to make sure that that person understands absolutely everything from point A to Z, what's going on throughout the entire process. Good point. Yeah, that that is uh, that's crucial to the uh, to the process. Uh, one of the things that, uh, and I know you can speak to this as well. One of the things that I've also learned that's crucial to the process is when we are doing contracts uh, on properties that we're making sure that we are adhering to time frames and making sure that we are putting time frames on those contracts because those time frames being adhered to are crucial as far as getting acceptance or denials on contracts yeah. uh, as far as inspection periods where someone like wit actually comes into the scene uh things of that nature so 
um, again, the knowledge is power, having someone there. And also, if at all possible, having uh, or your client allowing you to some degree to have a relationship maybe with the person that's doing their mortgage to a certain extent, uh, just so you guys are on the same page as far as, you know, uh, their loan process or what they what they should and should not be uh, trying to look at and things of that nature. So um, knowledge uh, from both parties in that situation is, um, I, I believe, and my experience has been very crucial. So as we go through that process, uh, the home ownership process, uh, the, well, the search process, let's say, um, at this point, let's say we're bringing in, uh, we've got a, con a property under contract now, and the first step of that process uh, is more than likely to get a home inspection. So Whit, at this point, tell us a little bit about what you do and how you play into that process. Sure. So normally when you get an accepted purchase agreement, you have uh, the normal period is about 10 days uh, for your inspection process. Some are shorter, some are longer, but that typically is what's written in. Um, that's your entire due diligence. That's where you do your home inspection. You check school districts if you're interested in that. You're checking taxes, flood, et cetera. You're checking a lot of things other than just home inspection. But the home inspection is typically centered around the uh, that process, the inspection period. So when you do your home inspection, you got to realize that the person that you're hiring is working for you. So we're different than an appraiser. A lot of people compare the two of us. So an appraiser is working for the bank or the person lending the money. All they're worried about is making sure that the, the value of the property is enough to cover that loan. They're not there for you. You're paying them, but they're not there for you. They're there for the bank. But the home inspector is there for you. They're, they're coming in to determine major problems with the house. They're going to point out some small little stuff too. But the bigger issue is, is, is learning about the house. You know, is the roof in good shape? Is the foundation in good shape? You know, when when you go look at a house and you're interested in buying it, you're putting on uh, rose colored glasses because you're excited to move into this house. It looks great. And I'm the one that comes in and sometimes ruins the day. Not all the time. I don't try to. But sometimes that is what happens. So, uh, you know, I come in as a, a professional inspector with different different view of the house than you. So I'm looking at it in turn from top to bottom. So we, you know, do the exterior of the house, all the AC systems, et cetera. It is a non-invasive inspection, meaning we don't disassemble systems and disassemble walls, but we're looking at pretty much everything that we can get in the house and testing it and making sure it works. And then we're coming up with a full report. So we send you the report and then your agent a report as well. And this is why it's critical to have an agent that's experienced and knows what they're doing because they're the ones that are communicating that information from them to the listing agent who is negotiating whether or not they're repairing anything. And the important thing to remember is you're going to create what's called a buyer's response to the inspection and not everything on there is going to get fixed. You're going to send all the items that you want over to the listing agent. They can fix some of them, none of them, all of them, or sometimes they'll even offer you money towards closing as long as they don't write that in the contract as such. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of processes that go in there. So it's important that your agent has a good relationship with their inspector, but also that you realize you can call the inspector yourself. They're working there for you. You know, I'm right now, I think I'm uh, number three in the state for inspections for this year. So I do a lot of inspections and I don't, uh, you know, I don't go through and, and uh, beg for business, but if you don't use me, I always say, you know, find an inspector you mesh with that you can get on the phone that you can understand and we'll go through the process with you because you're hiring them. You know, they're your, basically your employee for that day. Uh, to come and represent your best interest. So make sure you find the right guy. Don't call on the phone to 15 different inspectors until you find the cheapest one. Uh, Cause that's a very common process. People do it with loan officers too. Uh, you know, when you, when you're talking about your loan, it's not just the numbers they throw out at you. There's a lot more that goes into that loan than what uh, that initial little quote is on quick end mortgage or uh, rocket mortgage. So pay very much attention to, don't try and, and beat every bit of the price down on everything because you'll end up costing yourself some money on the back end. But uh, I'm not telling you to go to the most expensive inspector, but don't try and no matter what kind of cheapest guy because there's a reason those of us cost a little bit more money than others. You know, whether we have drone technology, I have crawl space robots, I have a lot of things that uh, other people don't use, but those cost money, right? So the prices aren't necessarily equal. 
I'm not substantially more, but just letting you know that I get that a lot. You know, people will call until they find the cheapest guy. And I'm like, well, that's what you got, cheapest guy. So remember they're working for you and find the right one. So during the process, uh, with when you, let's say, I know you, you'll uh, typically get a phone call and get scheduled to take a look at a property. Are you open to uh, buyers meeting you at the property and actually going through the, the walkthrough with you? So I, I and ask a question. Okay, I absolutely recommend that they come to the inspection. I, I really don't like when a client skips an inspection because that's your opportunity one to pick my brain on things that I know about, uh, you know, and get a better explanation. Because um, I'm working on a report uh, this evening that has some slab cracks in it. The client didn't come; they're out of state. Well, it's very hard to uh, mm -hmm. communicate how a slab crack is on paper when I'm telling you it needs to be looked at, whereas I can explain a lot more on settling and expansive soils in person without it sounding like a scientific paper, like it does on a report. So there's, there's a lot of value in coming to the inspection. If you want your full value for what you're paying, uh, then you should definitely come. Okay. Well, that's good information. So once we get the, how, how long is your turnaround time typically on uh, an inspection report getting back to your client? So mine come back at the same day, every day. Now I, I finish them every night because I have more the next day. So. That's good information to know. So at this point, once we get that home inspection back, uh, I think uh, we kind of touched on it a little bit. Then there's a process that we go through with our clients to where we review that inspection report and we then either pitch base with the, with wit or we kind of go through and determine uh, exactly what needs and what may not need to be addressed. So, uh, so Salisa, can you shed a little bit of light on that process for us? I just text, sorry. I just texted, I could not hear you at that moment. So if you can repeat that and then I'll be able to chime in. Okay, I was, I'm sorry. I was just saying that once we get the inspection report back, and typically we have a process we go through with our clients uh, as far as taking a look at the report and addressing any issues. And I was just asking you to kind of expound on that process for us. So, yes. Yeah, so typically um, once we get a report back, like we said, typically it's working with a license, uh, which you have to be the license inspector when doing a home inspection. But if you're using one, um, they can typically, typically get the report back to you within 24, 48 hours. But of course, Time is of the essence when dealing with real estate. So you don't want an inspector that's going to take three to four or five days to get your report back. That's just insane because you're slowing down your process in time. That's going to cause problems on the back end. That's another conversation. But, um, but to answer your question, typically what happens is the inspector will email the buyer as well as the realtor. And then from there, for myself, I will read the report. There's typically going to be a summary page which summarizes things that the inspector feels are of importance that you should have addressed at that moment to address with the seller at that time, or not the buyer address, really will be your realtor that's addressing it uh, with the other realtor. Um, but in addition to that, I go farther than just looking at the summary because some people might say the summary is just an easy fix. Let's only just ask for the items on the summary page and move on. But sometimes there are things that are in that full report um, that the inspector may think that they are um, not of urgency at that time, but in a year or six months, it could be something that can yeah. affect the buyer at that time. So those items, and I'm not an inspector, but I can, you know, kind of dissect a report and even call with and say, hey, can you explain this to me? Do you think this is something we should have the seller address at this point? And if his answer is yes, um, or maybe, then at that point, I'll have the, the the conversation with the buyer and say, hey, this is something that could possibly, you know, cause you to bring attention to in a couple of months. Do you want to ask them for it? So all they can do is say yes or no. I mean, they can't, you know, they it, it's when you get to the inspection part, it's really going back to negotiations from when you first started the purchase agreement. You're negotiating. And like we said, they're, they're either going to repair it all repair some of it, repair none of it, or give you an allowance to repair it at your own expense once the deal closed. Um, so it's very vital that when you get that report that you look at more than just the sum, make sure that your realtor is, and of course, hopefully it's me, but you make sure that your realtor 
he is looking at more than just a summary. You want to read that full cool report. Now, granted, some of them may be 15, 20, 30 pages, but typically when I get them, if it's at night, I'm a night, I'm, I'm a, a night owl. So I will read those reports at night and make my comments on them to be able to discuss with the buyer on the next day so that we can pull out the items that we want to ask the seller to repair or address. Exactly. That's the good response. I'm, I'm kind of that same, in the same boat as well. I, when I get them, uh, I love to sit there and I'll go through them with a fine tooth comb and kind of make notations on same things. If we need to address this, do we need, not need to address this? Uh, especially if you're looking at someone like a first time home buyer, um, when they already may not have a lot of disposable income to deal with anyway, you don't want to put them in a situation of purchasing a home or closing on a home. And then, like you said, uh, just a, a simple conversation with someone like with um, may stop them from some additional expenses um, in the various near future that they didn't necessarily have to incur. They could have just walked away from that deal if it was just going to be too much for them. Correct. So, um, so let's move on from that process. Once once we get um, that, that inspection report from WIT, and um, let's just say, you know, we're able to work out the terms and everything uh, from there, then at that moment, we're kind of, most of the time, kind of in a little dead period. Um, and sometimes when you get into that dead period, sometimes our clients get a little antsy. Um, they want to know what's going on. They want to know why there's not a whole lot of movement going on. Um, I've even had some to go out and start shopping. <laughs> so let's address that issue. Um, what do you tell your clients, uh, Ms. Latoya? Uh, and Miss Lisa. Uh, as a matter of fact, we'll start with uh, uh, you, Miss Lisa. Okay. Uh, I may know the answer to this already, uh, but what do you tell your clients when they get into this home ownership process and they get pre-approved about going out and starting to shop? Initial consultation, initial email, the next week email, no ma'am, no sir. Credit cards are on freeze. <laughs> You do not want a new cell phone bill. I mean, you do not want a new cell phone. You do not want a new car. You do not want that refrigerator that's on sale, the bundle package at Home Depot or Lowe's. You don't want it right now. You can lay away it, but we will not pull out our credit card. We will not even try to spend that much money on our bank card. I literally had a client um, at the beginning of this year. She was having her friends to give her cash money because she was so afraid to even use her bank account to buy lunch. Um, and that wasn't a fear that I put in her. She had just worked so hard to get to that process. She was like, Miss Lisa, I'm not spending a dollar. Um, and it was funny at that time, but of course you still want to be able to eat lunch. But when it comes to that, the, that, that social security number, no. Those credit cards, no. Put them in the safe. They are not to be used unless you have had the chance to speak with your lender um, and they've told you that you can do that, whatever that that is that you may be trying to do. But if it's Latoya, I'm certain she's going to say no to using a credit card to buy a refrigerator or wash and dry. We don't care if it's on sale for the bundle package, for the fridge, the dishwasher, the stove, the wash and dryer for $1,500. We don't care. No, you can't get it. <laughs> not until you close yeah so i communicate that in initial conversations on my initial email that i sent out i reinforce that as well it's it can kill a deal yeah. oh i'm going to say ditto that to, uh to what lisa said you know um if you go back to the cross <laughs> A part of what looks good in your loan is your assets. And if you're spending them up, you're subtracting from them. That's one thing. But then another part of your cross is your credit. So if you're running your name, that could jeopardize your name. So you kind of want to, I tell people, lay low off the radar. You, you on tuna fish and red beans and rice <laughs> until you close. And that's a reason we do like to move quickly once we do have them in the loan process, because we literally kind of are putting their lives on hold, you know? So we like to hurry that process along for them so that they can get their home and move on with life. 
Agreed. I want to go back to you right quick, Whit, because uh, I, I have another question. Um, I know sometimes with uh, with a home inspection, you may have to go back out uh, and and reinspect or, or retake a look at something. Uh, is that something that happens uh, very often? So it can happen uh, usually when dealing with inexperienced agents, actually. So a lot of times that a agent won't have the power on for the house or the water or gas. Now, sometimes that can happen just because it gets cut off, you know, in between the time last time they were there. But we find that a lot of times with uh, people that have not been in the business very long, don't check those type of things. And so that's why, again, it's so important to have somebody that is knowledgeable and knows what they're doing. It, it prevents a lot of a lot of issues on every side. So it, it kind of goes into just like we've been saying all along. If you find the right people to work with and uh, referral partners to work with, then you just have an easier experience in your home birth. But it does happen though, yes. That, yes, it does. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, so at this point, once we get to this stage of the process, the, the, the dead period that I did address a little bit earlier, uh, I think most of the time that's probably really when uh, people like Latoya are kind of doing their work behind the scenes. So give us, give us a little bit of an idea of what's happening during that time frame. Oh yeah. There are so many key people. Uh, just, just a little snippet of that is just all who's represented on this call tonight, but there's so many key people that are involved in making this process move from your realtor to your loan officer. Well, you also have processors. You also have underwriters. So once you've gotten your home under contract, and you have passed your inspection, and you're ready for sure to move forward with that home, you have to do three major things after that. One, you have to process your loan. Two, you have to underwrite your loan. And three, you got a good lender, you're gonna close that loan, okay? And those things are happening behind the scenes while you kind of wait. And we do get it, you know, uh, you mentioned that little quiet period. I don't know that it's, super quiet with us because we do a ton of updating. <laughs> we update listing agents, we update the title companies, we keep everybody kind of in the loop on a weekly basis. So you can know, even though it may seem a little quiet, there's things happening in this process. So processing, underwriting and closing is what happens after you have secured that property. Okay. And I know one of the things that happens during this process also is the uh, appraisal. So, um, we, we don't have an appraiser on the line with us tonight necessarily, but um, I know a lot of times, well, not a lot of times, the appraisals are ordered uh, through the, the lenders. And um, so uh, that's a, a key piece of what's happening during that time frame. also. Uh, mm -hmm. In most instances, I usually try to make sure that the uh, lender, mortgage company, or whoever I'm dealing with, doesn't actually go through actually ordering that appraisal until we know for sure that we've gotten uh, the go ahead and the green light on that inspection and things of that nature, because we don't want our clients to spend money that they don't necessarily have to spend and they can't recoup. So um, let's take a look at some uh, questions online here. Let's see. Um, we have one here. I've only heard of a 15 or 30 year mortgage. Is there a 20 year and would you recommend it? Uh, Ms. Latoya? Yep. So uh, absolutely, there are, there is a 20 year mortgage and um, the, it's typically pretty comparable to a 15 year mortgage. So it just really depends on what your goals are. Most people want a 20 year mortgage or they ask about a 20 year mortgage because they're thinking, I don't want a 30 year mortgage. I don't want to Pay that long and then hey, I don't want to pay it soon as 15 years. But it just depends on what your goals are. Some people are looking to just accelerate that equity and pay the loan off sooner. So sometimes we can do that with a 30 year mortgage and still accomplish the same thing without being obligated to that larger payment on a 20 year mortgage. So what are your thoughts on <laughs> what are your thoughts on quick and loan slash rocket mortgage? <laughs> uh, or do you have any thoughts on that? I have all negative thoughts. All negative thoughts, Wit says. Tell, 
uh, without going into a whole lot of detail, we tell us what what makes you say that. So uh, I was a realtor before I was an inspector, and uh, going through with a few clients that dealt with uh, Quicken Loans and Rocket Mortgage. If you want a surefire way to either not close or close about thirty days after you think you're going to close and spend more money than you're going to spend locally, that's the way to go. <laughs> okay. Okay. Quick and, and short <laughs> to the point. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, do we have any more online questions? Okay. Not a, okay. Who works with investors and what advice would you have for them? I work with investors. I'm an investor as, as well. Um, the most important thing, uh, investment is a completely different thing from just your regular real estate day to day. Um, so it's, it's imperative to know exactly what you're getting into. Um, the financial part of it is completely different than what Latoya has discussed tonight. Um, the inspection part is very, very important when it comes to investment properties. Um, you want to try to have as much cash on hand as you possibly can. Also, you know, of course, people always say you always want to use the bank money to buy investment properties. Um, but and that is true. But it's a cycle that you have to go through to get to that point. Um, but the most important thing with dealing with investment investment properties and in, investors is a good team. You have to have a great team because if you don't um, and that team doesn't just consist of the three people that you see on the screen, your loan officer, your inspector and a real and a realtor. The, the, the key part of that is your contractor. Because if you don't have a, a, a reliable and a good contractor, you will be broke before you finish your first project. Yeah. Yes, the contractor is uh, probably definitely one of the is the most important person in that process. Uh, um, they hold the keys to making sure uh, if it's a if it's a property, if it's a. Uh, multifamily property, whatever the situation is, they hold the keys to how quickly you can get that property turned around and and ready for renting or ready to be occupied for your business or whatever the situation is. So and uh, and as they say, time is money. Yeah. So uh, if you have to go through one contractor to another to get the job done the way it needs to be done, then it's costing you money if you're an investor. Uh, and the one thing I've learned is that with investors um it's just a totally different mindset as well yes uh and an investor is in in most instances um not scared of a lot of the small things that may typically scare away a home buyer uh yeah. from from um going through the process because they're 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 used to the experience and they just that just the mindset is totally different they're looking at at it from a totally different perspective so um, we do have a question here concerning uh, bankruptcy. Uh, no. Well, that's actually uh, that's one of the questions I wanted to ask. I'll go back to that one. Um, uh, someone that has experienced a bankruptcy, um, how are they able to purchase a home? Uh, and if so, uh, do they have to be discharged from that bankruptcy for a certain period of time or exactly what's the situation uh what can you tell us about that absolutely so that's some good news you know bankruptcies there's many reasons why those happen unfortunately they do have to happen for some people but the good news is they're able to rebuild after that and are able to purchase a home each loan has a different time they call it seasoning from the discharge or dismissal date so it depends on if you've got a chapter seven or a chapter 13, if you're going with the government insured loan or if you're going with the government regulated. But some of them cause you to wait for uh, two years, some of them for three years. It just depends on the circumstances with that particular bankruptcy. But the good answer is yes, you can purchase your home after having a Okay. So the question that um, I just saw pop up there um, and it kind of went away. Can we get that question back up? How can a process be if someone has filed bankruptcy? Mm -hmm. do, you, do you understand? I'm not quite sure if I understand the question. Well, I know what's most common with that is 
people wanting to know how long they have to wait with that. Mm -hmm. And again, that's called the season. So it's all based on that discharge or dismissal date. So some people think, well, I, I filed back in, back in so-and-so, but when did you get discharged or dismissed? So from that particular date, there's a seasoning requirement depending upon the loan. And we can start at one year for some chapter 13s, two years for sevens, three years for bankruptcies that actually included mortgages. So it just depends on your situation. But you can buy after a bankruptcy. Okay. Well, that's, that's good to know. Um, there are a lot of people out there that unfortunately go through that situation. So it's good, good information for them to know that uh, there's still hope uh, that they can become a homeowner. Absolutely. Yes. So what's the best resource to get a list of foreclosed homes? A realtor. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. I get that question a lot. And there are a lot of websites out there and you have to be very careful because a lot of the websites will tell you to get a foreclosed list, um, submit a payment of $25 or $50. You never want to pay to receive listings of homes. Um, a licensed realtor can uh, email you homes from the MLS or your licensed realtor can give you websites that are government backed that have direct websites where you can go on and browse for um, different homes that are foreclosed. You can also look at the sheriff's sale list. It depends on the type of thing that be financing. Is it going to be cash? Or are you trying to do auction? Um, there, it's many different ways, but the most important thing is you should never have to pay for anything um, regarding getting homes or listings of homes. That information can come for free from your realtor. Okay. So, and as we get ready to kind of go into the closing part of this, um, we're on the back end of the process now, let's say. Um, we're to the point where we're just about ready to get that clear to close from uh, Ms. Latoya. And um, what are you telling your clients are doing with them during this part of the process to get them to the finish line? I didn't understand the question. Did you say, what are we telling them? Yes. What are you, what are you doing with them at, at this part of the process? Uh, once, once you're getting close to that, that end part of the process, that clear to close that we all love to, to see and hear, uh, what, what are you telling your clients uh, right as we're getting ready to go to closing? Sure. Other than threatening them, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, what I'm telling them is, you know, I'm really just encouraging them and constantly reminding them a lot of times when they're in this part of the process, especially if it's their first time, they do get a little bit of nerves. They do have some anxieties and we spend a good bit of time just congratulating them, uh, you know, constantly updating them, making sure all of those final pieces are in to the underwriter for that, uh, that final clear to close. And again, just being there for them, supporting them morally, saying, hey, you're doing a great job. Congratulations, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, what about yourself, uh, Ms. Lisa? Um, the same thing when, um, if you're working with a lender that is as tech savvy as Latoya and her team, you're going to be getting those weekly updates. So you know when you're very close to that point. So at that point with me, at this point, my clients and I are almost, well, we're really good friends at this point. So we're sending emojis and dancing and shouting and all of that stuff and saying, hey, you're almost home. You're almost home. You're almost there. We're waiting on that CTC, that clear to close. So it's a, a, an exciting moment at that time. Absolutely. And then we finally get to closing and we get to jingle those keys and pass everything on to them after they sign all those documents that they do have to sign. Yes. Um, but it's it's a, a very enjoyable moment for uh, everybody involved at that point. Uh, you've hopefully forged uh, a long lasting relationship with that person that um, they've trusted you throughout the entire process and they don't have a problem with uh, even referring others to you um, because you're always going to need that good mortgage person. You're always going to need that that good realtor. You're always going to need that that good home inspector that's going to be truthful with you 
and that's going to really look out for your best interest. Um, the, the, the thing that really can hurt you is if you have a home inspector, let's say, for example, that at this point is just trying to get through the process and just trying to get an inspection report in your hand and they're not really being truthful with you about um, what needs to be done with that property because it absolutely can hurt um, not only his reputation, but the realtor uh, as well on the back end. So um, thank you guys for the session today. And I see we have our director on now, Sister Karen Burks. Yes, hello everyone. This was amazing on tonight. I received so much information. I, I've taken notes. One of the big things that I received was the financial cross. I love that Latoya, thank you so much for that. Um, thank you again for Ms. Alicia Marshall, Mr. Whit Green, and also um, Brother Thomas Gibson. Thank you so much for moderating this. You did an amazing job. So um, just a bit of information for our viewers. We will have a part two to this. So don't worry. I know some of those questions you guys were not able to get answered, but this was a great session so that we can be able to uh, at least get some more information out to you guys. A way to start that wealth building is what we want to do within the economic empowerment department here at United Christian Faith Ministries. Um, definitely want to shout out our pastor, Pastor Mark A. Ellis, our leader. Um, one quick thing I want to say before we end on tonight, um, anyone who could email me um, the four things on the financial cross, if you can email that to me at econ emp at ucfministries.org that's e c o n e m p at ucf ministries that are g i do have something very special for you someone that um submits that the um within first one that i received should i say um i do have something for you so i'm going to go ahead and end for tonight if you guys have anything lasting to say if not, we'll, we'll go ahead and end. You did an amazing, amazing job, guys. All right. Well, good night, and we shall have a part two of this. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Good night. Bye.